Is China's economic miracle over forever? Recent data flashing warning signs across the economy. What are the global consequences? Are American bank accounts unwittingly funding Chinese companies? U.S. lawmakers accuse two firms of facilitating capital flows to America's foremost foreign adversary. Are kids spending too much time with their screens? China's cyber regulator has a new plan to fix that, and it's sending tech stocks reeling. Sun bears or humans dressed in costumes. All eyes at a Chinese zoo fell on a bear standing on its hind legs. What do you think about the unusual report? Let us know below and subscribe if you haven't already. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. More gloomy data for China's economy. Official figures released Monday show China's factory activity on the downturn for a fourth straight month. The consumer sector also hit its lowest rate since December, marrying its weakest point since the start of the pandemic. But what does China's slowdown mean for the world economy? Let's take a closer look. Global factory activity further shrank in July. That's according to private surveys on Tuesday. It was a sign that slowing growth and weakness in China were taking a toll on the world economy. It highlights the dilemma for policymakers who pursued aggressive tightening cycles in a battle to keep inflation down, all while they try to stop potential recessions. China's Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index fell to 49.2 in July. A reading below 50 marks a contraction in activity. Surveys showed that manufacturing activity also declined in major Asian economies, Japan and South Korea. It shows the pressure slower Chinese demand is placing on the region. Is China's high-growth miracle era a thing of the past? Massive debt, youth unemployment and deflation risks, the country now showing signs of a significant economic slowdown after decades of rapid growth. A highly anticipated post-pandemic recovery seems to have flopped. How are foreign investors and global firms reacting? Let's zoom in. From consumer goods giant Unilever to automaker Nissan, global firms have warned of slowing earnings in China. That, as the world's second largest economy, loses its post-health crisis bounce. Some sectors have enjoyed a continued rebound, such as luxury goods and dining. This has driven double-digit China sales growth for the likes of Starbucks and LVMH. Starbucks reported a 46% surge in comparable China sales last quarter, and Louis Vuitton owner LVMH reported a better-than-expected 17% rise in global second-quarter sales. But even those firms have stopped short of raising their China outlook. And consumer goods firms like Procter & Gamble, L'Oreal and Coca-Cola have taken a cautious stance. Last week, Unilever said it was seeing a historical low for consumer confidence in the country. Global automakers also face a tough environment. They now have to compete with increased competition from domestic rivals in China. Local car makers took a more than 50% share of the market in the first half of 2023 for the first time. Volkswagen cut its full year sales targets last week due to a sales dip in China, its top market. Even Apple, which reports earnings on Thursday, is likely to post flat iPhone sales in its third largest market. Post-pandemic slowdowns and a skyrocketing jobless rate as Beijing grapples to pull its economy out of turmoil. From manual laborers to college graduates, concerns about jobs and incomes are sweeping the world's second largest economy. For young people between 16 and 24, the unemployment rate hit a record 21 percent last month. But because that count only covers those actively seeking jobs, an economist said the real number could be as high as 50 percent. While many young people are getting forced to settle for low-paying jobs, those near retirement age are struggling to keep their families afloat. What's behind the shocking trend? China's real estate market once accounted for a quarter of the country's economic growth. But the sector is now on a downward spiral. As a result, Chinese state debts are running up at local levels as weak exports continue to weigh on economic growth. 
What's more, according to British consumer goods giant Unilever, China's consumer confidence has tumbled to a historic low. Swiss engineering group ABB also reported a fall of 9 percent in its orders with China during the second quarter. Are Americans unwittingly funding blacklisted Chinese companies? A U.S. House committee is trying to find out after two U.S. firms reportedly allowed hundreds of millions of dollars in capital flow to America's foremost foreign adversary. NTD's Melina Weiskup has more. In the first solid action taken by the House's Select Committee on China, members are investigating two firms, BlackRock, which is the world's largest asset manager, and MSCI. It's a bipartisan effort, and the Republican chairman, along with the top Democrat on the committee, are saying that BlackRock has invested more than $429 million in Chinese companies that have been blacklisted by the government over either national security or human rights issues. As a country, we have to have a national policy on outbound investment. We also have to look at what are, why do we make it so favorable to invest in China still? And when I recently asked Chairman Gallagher about strategically decoupling from China, he said that the economic aspect will be the hardest piece of the puzzle. We have to figure out a way to reclaim our economic independence, to stop funding our own destruction, and to take the golden blindfolds off when it comes to the risks of doing business with Beijing. The chairman is now introducing a bill to force tax exempt entities such as nonprofits, universities, or public pension plans to divest from China, otherwise lose their tax exempt status. Gallagher saying that these nonprofits must choose. Are they committed to their professed values or to financing a genocidal communist regime? Do you think this is a step in the right direction? Absolutely. I think that uh, it's, and, and it shouldn't go only to nonprofits and higher education institutions. And the Senate has taken action on Chinese investments too, recently passing a bill that would require U.S. firms to notify the Treasury if they're investing in Chinese tech companies. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Melina Weiskup, NTD News. As for why these two are in the spotlight, BlackRock and MSCI represent two of the world's largest asset managers and leading index providers. BlackRock oversees more than $9 trillion in assets, with millions of Americans relying on it for their future retirement. MSCI holds over $13 trillion in funds. A brief review of MSCI indexes and BlackRock funds points to the two companies together having directed investments into over 60 Chinese entities already on the U.S. blacklist. As for the fallout on Americans, Congress members Gallagher and Krishnamurti say Americans are, quote, unwittingly funding Chinese companies that build weapons for the Chinese military, known as the People's Liberation Army, as a direct result of BlackRock and MSCI's decisions. Adding that's giving a hand to the Chinese Communist Party's, quote, stated mission of technological supremacy. Both BlackRock and MSCI have said they are reviewing the lawmakers' request for information. Two more Chinese companies are facing U.S. bans. The reason? Forced labor concerns. The additions bring Washington's Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act entities list to 24. That comes from a statement of the Homeland Security Department. Secretary Mayorkas stated the department will continue to work with all of its partners to keep goods made with forced labor from Xinjiang out of U.S. commerce. The ban takes effect Wednesday. Under it, a battery maker and a spice producer are barred from exporting their goods to the U.S. Beijing responded immediately, calling the accusation against the companies a lie designed to smear China's image. Worth noting, the U.S. has deemed China's persecution of the Uyghur ethnic group as genocide and crimes against humanity. How much time should kids spend on their phones? Not much, according to China's cyberspace regulator. The agency put out a memo on Wednesday saying those 16 to 18 years old should be limited to two hours of screen time a day. It went on to recommend one hour for ages 8 to 16 and a meager eight minutes for kids under eight years old. But there's more. To help enforce it, the Cyberspace Administration of China urged smartphone service providers to launch something called Minor Mode. When in use, it would restrict minors from going online between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. 
The proposal sent tech stocks tumbling. A similar impact to Beijing's 2021 curfew on video game screen time for kids under 18. Though the agency says parents would be allowed to opt out of their limits for their kids. The guidelines are open to public feedback until early September. A bear or an outfit straight out of a costume party. One animal at China's Hangzhou Zoo is taking center stage in an unusual Animal Kingdom report. Let's zoom in. A hot topic on Chinese social media, leaving viewers scratching their heads. A debate over whether a bear at a zoo is actually a human dressed in a costume. Over 20,000 visitors flocked to the zoo, with many traveling overnight to get there just for a peek at the controversial bear. The uproar is all because of one Malayan sun bear named Angela, a zoo resident in southern China's Hangzhou. A video recorded the sun bear from behind as it stood on its hind legs, an unexpected pose for the animal. But many have likened the folding fur on its body to clothing wrinkles. Others take note of the creature's unusually slender legs. The zoo's daily admissions jumped 30 percent since the video's release. The zoo has denied the costume speculations, responding in a statement that the bear is very real and, quote, definitely not a human, and citing the impossibility of a person withstanding the heat of a full fur suit amid blazing summer temperatures. The zoo also reminded social media users that sun bears are the smallest of their kind in the world, unlike other much bigger varieties that are more commonly seen. China is cranking up controls of Japanese food imports, and Japanese restaurants in Beijing are paying the price. Some owners are reporting customer numbers down by up to 90 percent. But why? Let's take a closer look. To become a sushi chef like 49-year-old Kazuyuki Tanioka takes years of study and practice. Like many of his Japanese compatriots, his knife skill is likely among the best in the world. But it's the ingredients he's using which could yet bring down the curtain on his eight-year-old restaurant in the Chinese capital, Beijing. The hardest thing for us now is that we can't purchase any Japanese seafood at all because it's taking so long to clear Chinese customs due to the treated radioactive water release issue. Like most Japanese restaurants in China, Tanioka's outlet Toya imports fish from Japan. But Chinese restrictions on some of those imports are making business harder. Shortly after the 2011 tsunami and earthquake damaged the Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan, Beijing banned food and agricultural products from five Japanese prefectures. That ban was later widened and now covers 10 of Japan's 47 prefectures. The latest restrictions were brought in as Japan plans to empty into the sea treated radioactive water from Fukushima, a move endorsed by the United Nations nuclear watchdog, but sharply criticized by China. Since around mid-July, with the planned release of treated radioactive water, the number of Chinese customers has slid around 90 percent due to worries about Japanese food ingredients. Imports have since all but ground to a halt, with some Japanese officials fearing the worst is yet to come. While more stringent Chinese checks have led to massive delays at customs, the bigger worry is what customers are saying. Posts and hashtags on Chinese social media claim Japanese food is radioactive and should be boycotted. This customer said he was reassured by the steps China had taken, calling it a responsible attitude. But some say when it comes to Japanese food, there are misconceptions about what is and isn't safe. I don't know about the Fukushima water release in much detail, but if you have a look, you'll find other places are doing the same thing, releasing things into nature. The fact that the average person just doesn't know this, this is the hardest thing. If they knew about it, then they would know they could eat safely. Japanese officials have appealed to their Chinese counterparts, especially in their second largest market, Hong Kong, to avoid a ban. Some importers have meanwhile said they're considering shipping their product through a third country. Chefs like Tanioka have said they're now looking at sourcing ingredients from inside China to survive. And while even with the restrictions, China remains the largest importer of Japanese seafood. If these problems continue, that may not be the case for much longer. 
Japan's prime minister defended the plan to release wastewater from Fukushima, saying the International Nuclear Energy Agency concluded the water released into the Pacific Ocean is in line with international safety standards, and noting the water gets treated with advanced liquid processing system methods to make it safe. We will give the international community a detailed explanation of our country's efforts with a high degree of transparency. I strongly urge the Chinese side to engage in a debate based on the scientific evidence. Japan is set to start releasing more than a million tons of water from the wrecked Fukushima power plant this summer. The Chinese regime is the plan's biggest critic. Another big story to look out for, good news for carmakers reliant on Chinese lithium for batteries. One of Europe's first large-scale lithium refineries approved in the UK and soon to produce the much-needed material critical to powering electric cars. That report and more coming up tomorrow on China in Focus. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. Here's what to look out for in our second half. Is China's miracle growth era coming to an end? And what hurdles lie ahead? Declining birth rates, mounting public and private debt, and de-risking. China's anticipated post-pandemic recovery hasn't taken shape. With recent data pointing to a different story, weak overall growth, and an apparent downward trend. Can Beijing reverse it? And how will China's slowdown impact the global economy? We sat down with Pete Earle, economist at the American Institute for Economic Research, for details. The full episode is available on our partner platform, AppLock TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.